Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. And before we get started, just a reminder for you guys out there, the Block Crunch Podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Neither the host nor its guests are licensed financial advisors, and nothing discussed should be construed as financial advice. Views held by Block Crunch's guests are their own, and sponsorship messages do not constitute financial advice or endorsement. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Today's episode of the Block Crunch Podcast is brought to you by Protocol Labs, the guys behind Filecoin. And with me today is Colin Efren, who leads ecosystem at Protocol Labs. So Colin, can you give us a brief state of the Filecoin ecosystem today? So Filecoin is uh, almost 15 exabytes of storage capacity and 463 petabytes of real storage uh, data. Um, and if you take all of Web3 storage protocols, Filecoin powers 99% of total storage capacity and 95% of storage utilization. Uh, in 2002, 70,000 developers were exposed to Filecoin through our various hackathon partnerships, and 500 startups are actively building on Filecoin, ranging from Series C funding to Series D funding. Uh, in aggregate, they've raised about $500 million in capital and continue to grow into 2023. Hello there. Now, before I move on, I'd love to thank the hundreds of you who have subscribed to Blockrunch VIP, because with your support, I've been able to share my real thoughts on specific projects that I don't usually share on interviews in a format that I enjoy more, which is by weekly written posts. We've also been able to offer exclusive AMAs, sharing my investment frameworks, interactable models, and breaking down important trends before they become big. Now, we even had Elon Musk comment on one of our threads recently. So if you haven't already, head on over to theblockrunch.com slash VIP, and you can access dozens of hours of research for what you'd spend on a coffee a day. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. Now, recently, we have a few asset managers, including some of the largest in the world, like BlackRock, apply to create Bitcoin spot ETFs in the United States. And this sparked a lot of speculation about whether this could herald institutional adoption of crypto and kickstart a whole new bull market. However, it's not totally smooth sailing ahead as well, because we have the SEC already having a history of striking down 33 prior applications for similar products. And they've also stated that the current batch of applications may lack some key details required for them to be approved. Now, in addition, if you've been following crypto for a while, you know that the SEC is not the biggest fan of crypto as well. They've gone after two of the industry's most prominent companies recently, including Coinbase and Binance with lawsuits. So there's a lot to unpack here, and I thought the best person to bring on the show is Ram Aluelia, the founder of Lumita, which is a digitally native independent investment advisor. So Ram has been on the show before, and I'm really, really grateful for you to come on the show again. So thanks so much, man. Thank you for having me, Jason. Always a pleasure to be here. So let's kick us off by talking about the ETF in general. So why is this spot ETF you know, stirring so much excitement? Like, why, why is it important for crypto as a whole? Well, the, the notable development is that you've got the largest asset manager in the world, BlackRock, which manages trillions of dollars. They filed an ETF. So BlackRock has put their hat in the ring when others have failed. Now, for context, this is the 28th attempt at a Bitcoin ETF. The first attempt was an application uh, filed by the Winklevoss twins back in 2013. So uh, BlackRock uh, CEO Larry Fink was on Fox Business yesterday. He was limited in what he could say due to the fact that they're in application now. But he said, look, our track record speaks for itself. And the BlackRock ETF track record is 575 approvals and one rejection. Yeah. And I, I'm curious on, on, on that note, given... Uh, you, you're in touch with a lot of the institutions in the U.S. Do you get the sense that there's a lot of pent up demand for this product? And, you know, why can't BlackRock clients today just buy Spot or even CME Futures or any, you know, existing products? Yeah, so there's clearly a lot of demand for Bitcoin and digital assets through the convenience of a brokerage account, uh, especially when you don't have to pay a high 2% fee like you have with the Grayscale products or deal with these discount to NAV issues. BlackRock and these other potential ETF issuers are commercial businesses. They have a business case. They have a business plan. They see an opportunity here uh, to bet on further adoption. 
Now, the ETF is necessary to transform access to Bitcoin into a security format or a security wrapper. When you invest in an ETF, that ETF will have a mechanism to buy and sell spot using a daily auction process, enlisting support of various market makers to ensure that there's a balance between the net asset value of the ETF and the uh, value of the Bitcoin that it represents. But the fundamental answer to your question is that you need to have Bitcoin in a security format so that it can ride the rails of how brokerage works. Mm. So in order to kind of bridge Bitcoin into the broader institutional finance world, this product is necessary and it's not sufficient to just have what we have right now, which is like CME futures. That's right. You need a securities filing. You need to have straight through processing. You need to have uh, integrations. You need to have a fixed protocol. There's a lot to list a security uh, to make that work. And an ETF would make Bitcoin consumable in the capital markets. You mentioned earlier that there has been a lot of attempts, uh, like 28 attempts before that were struck down already. And I was looking into one of the most recent examples with Bitwise. I think SEC rejected them on the grounds of there not being some sort of a surveillance sharing agreement that effectively lets the SEC police manipulation. I think it's a mechanism that lets people, let, lets the SEC see, you know, who's uh, insider trading and allows them to catch people who are insider trading on you know, current ETF products. And is this something that is inherent to crypto, given that most venues are you know, global and not licensed in the U.S.? Is this going to be hard to find that venue for, for these ETFs? It's a great question. So, yes, the common objection that the SEC has shared in their very lengthy rejections of these ETFs going on like 90 plus pages is the lack of a framework for a shared surveillance agreement. Uh, and as you said, there are quite a few others that have attempted, uh, including 21 shares on ARC, which are first in line, by the way. So we'll learn first there before we learn about whether BlackRock was approved, as well as others, including Fidelity, as you said, Bitwise, Wisdom Tree, uh, Nighting, and others. So a shared surveillance agreement is very common. I know it sounds a bit ominous. Uh, and it's really specific to the nature of crypto adjacent, as you pointed out. Let me draw a contrast for you. So if you have an ETF that trades a basket of securities, let's say the S&P 500, the SPY ETF, which is also issued by BlackRock's iShares business, well, the securities that comprise that ETF, they all trade on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. So you can point to those exchanges. And the reason why that's necessary is because the SEC requires a mechanism to detect market manipulation. And you pointed out several types of behaviors that the SEC wants to detect. One is wash sale trading, two is insider trading, three would be market manipulation, fourth would be pump and dump uh, issues. They wanna also be able to identify the actors too. So they need a detection framework so that the SEC can perform the investigations they need to do. So Bitcoin is decentralized and it makes it more challenging, but there's a way to accomplish it. And what the SEC has said they're looking for is they're looking for a quote, regulated exchange. Now we gotta come back to what that means in the context of, of Coinbase and two, a large market participant. Those are the two criteria they focused on. Mm, and I, I guess that that's really interesting to dive into because most of the liquidity and volume and activity in crypto trading is not on Coinbase, right? It's on exchanges like Binance, which as you know, the SEC has gone after and they're not registered in the US. In fact, they've been pushed out of the US. So is it even you know, plausible to think that Coinbase could fit that role as being the provider of this you know, sharing, shared surveillance? It's a great point, right? And as you pointed out, 70% of the spot market is traded on Binance. And of course, perps are arguably the primary instrument that's used to express a view on crypto. Uh, I believe that Coinbase would be sufficient. There have been cases uh, in the past where uh, US exchanges that did not have dominant market share were approved. So I believe that is possible. And also, 
I don't know that we truly understand the volumes on Binance, right? There may be wash sale trading happening on Binance anyway, so it's hard to really understand. But what you really need is a, a comprehensive approach to buttressing this kind of shared surveillance agreement. I had an interesting conversation yesterday with um, Asaf Mayer, who's the CEO of Solidus Labs. There are three of these software companies that would implement how you do the shared surveillance agreements. And what he was saying is that you need to have multiple exchanges that are coordinating, and that would include decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, who, by the way, are cooperating, and as many centralized exchanges as possible. So not just Coinbase, but Kraken and ideally Binance. So if you can put all of that on a silver platter, it seems to me that it would be difficult for the SEC to reject an application on the grounds that they've stated. So the actual candidates that need to work with the SEC here are probably Coinbase, as you mentioned, Binance. But what about some of the offshore ones or like more perceived to be Chinese ones like OKEX, Huobi? Are they expected to cooperate as well? And you know, how likely are they actually to, to, to cooperate? It's a good question. And what I, what I just shared for you is what would be uncontestable, right? If you had the major exchanges and the decentralized exchanges cooperate with a vendor like a Solidus Labs and there, there are two others, then I believe then that's a sufficient standard that cannot be contested by the SEC. That's a very high standard though. I don't think that's a requirement to have smaller international exchanges as a part of that. And Coinbase may well be sufficient too. Now, if you look at the BlackRock application, they're not specific to how they will implement the shared surveillance agreement. They do name NASDAQ, they do name Coinbase, but that's about it. So NASDAQ would be the exchange where the ETF is listed. So that's one part of the equation. But you also need to have an exchange like Coinbase that is doing the detection. You know, there's a shot, uh, but the SEC could have a room to say, no, this is not sufficient. Mm. And I guess, is that the main thing that you think is impacting the SEC's decision, it, it, the existence of a acceptable you know, sh shared surveillance agreement, or are there other things that these applicants to the ETF should be looking out for? That appears to be the primary thing. If you look at the rejections, that is the uh, number one cited reason why these ETF applications are rejected. So... I hope that we can get the exchanges to cooperate and submit an ETF response that would address that issue. Now, the other more cynical interpretation is that the SEC just doesn't want to approve this and will find another reason not to approve it, even if you have a shared surveillance agreement. That's just speculation. It's hard to assess that. If you look at it just from a due process perspective, you look at hey, here's an application, here's a rejection from the SEC, here's what the SEC said, and if you take that on good faith, then the answer to that is to have uh, software that will test for you know, the items that we discussed earlier. And this is quite interesting because for me as an outsider, I've always been a little bit confused about the SEC's official stance on crypto as a whole. Because obviously you had Gensler you know, publicly going after Binance and Coinbase. But then I think two weeks before the recording of this episode, they also approved a 2 weeks levered Bitcoin ETF. Um, so what, what do you think is the, is there a political agenda against crypto? It's so hard to understand what is going inside the mind of Chair Gensler. You know, when he says, come in and register, number one, when he says, when he refuses to answer a direct question from the chair <laughs> of the U.S. House Financial Services Committee on whether Ether is a security or commodity, when Chair Gensler was previously the head of the CFTC, and third, when he says, we already have digital dollars, meanwhile, Singapore and others and Japan are introducing frameworks for stablecoins, it's... And you see that 
Gensler is backed by the progressive wing of the Democrat Party, namely Senator Warren, who is building a campaign on anti-crypto. It's hard not to conclude that there is a political angle here. By the way, now that futures exchange, to your earlier point, the Bitcoin futures ETF, there the SEC can say, well, gee, we have a regulated market. Uh, and they can point to the CME. And now the question will be, is there another objection that the SEC can levy, which would be that they might claim Coinbase is not a regulated market. Of course, the SEC is claiming that SC, that Coinbase is an unlicensed securities exchange. So will the SEC fall back on that or not? That's an open question. Now, even if they were to make that claim, it gets interesting because Bitcoin is definitively a commodity. So you could say, well, gee, hey, SEC, you have a dispute with Coinbase, which is going through a judicial process around whether Coinbase is in compliance with securities laws, but that should have no bearing on uh, Coinbase offering Bitcoin. So that should not be relevant to whether Coinbase is uh, permitted to support a Bitcoin ETF. That would be the wrong of that argument. Actually, on that, um, given that there's already CME futures, there's even a levered Bitcoin product already, why can't these spot ETF providers just point to these as like a precedent and say, hey, you've approved very, very similar products uh, and we, we have proof that the futures trade very, very similar to spot market. Why can't they just use that uh, as a precedent and apply for, for the spot ETF? That's exactly what they're doing. So Grayscale's suit against the SEC points to the SEC's approval of the Bitcoin futures ETF, and then argues that the SEC is being inconsistent under, under the Administrative Procedures Act, which requires regulators to treat like circumstances similarly. So that is the argument. Uh, and the SEC is litigating that through the court system. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. And I think one big question that a lot of people have been asking is obviously this whole idea about a, a surveillance sharing agreement has been known since very early ETFs were applied for. But all of a sudden, you know, BlackRock threw their hat in the ring. And obviously, that's a name that most people would recognize. And as you mentioned, the track record kind of speaks for, speaks for itself. So a lot of people have been asking me, you know, what does BlackRock know? Like, why are they choosing Ooh, now to apply? I'm so glad you brought this topic up, Jason. I've been focused on this and I'll share, what, I'll share what it is. My thesis, which is informed talking to various market participants. Larry Fink and BlackRock see tokenization as the future. Asset classes are going on chain. It started with fiat, we call that stable coins, and other assets are inevitably going on chain. Look at the monetary authority of Singapore. Look at Japan. They're rolling out frameworks for tokenization. And BlackRock is the world's leading asset manager. The U.S. does not have a legal framework for tokenization. So if other markets get ahead of the United States, then BlackRock's position could be threatened. This is why you'll notice that yesterday, Larry Fink on Fox Business made yet again the case for blockchain and for tokenization. He also made this point. He said, ETFs disrupted the mutual fund industry. And he's saying that tokenization can disrupt how financial markets work. You don't need custodians if the blockchain can provide security guarantees for digital assets. So that's the broader point. He sees where the future is going. He's trying to preserve the relevance of the United States and BlackRock in a world where asset classes inevitably go on chain is a message, no question, that he's sending. Now, Larry Fink is a significant contributor to the Democratic Party, mm. and he has created a wedge in the Democratic Party. He's really split the progressive wing. And the reason why I say that it's a political message on the part of Larry Fink is because the ETF application 
left certain matters unspecified, including the specification of like the software provider, right? So it, it wasn't an A plus homework assignment that they submitted. Now they're going to update that based on the uh, re response that the SEC delivered to BlackRock. Mm. And I suppose if this is rejected, those will only be the second rejection they've ever had, right? Correct. The, S the BlackRock has won 575 approvals and the SEC has to apply due process, meaning they've got to apply the facts and the law. If not, you can sue them in the same way that Grayscale is suing the SEC now. So uh, I think this pokes a, a finger in the eye of Chair Gensler. I think Larry Fink is frustrated. Clients have demand for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is trading like a digital currency. Major Wall Street sell-side desks, including Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, my old shop, cover Bitcoin and digital assets. Uh, it trades against the U.S. dollar. It's sensitive to interest rates. Uh, Larry Fink says it is a, now an international asset. Uh, and then if you look at the infl inflation rates in Ghana or Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where it's 100% or 300%, Bitcoin is an alternative medium of exchange that can help people escape these inflation traps imposed by despotic regimes who want to control a population. So there's a noble purpose behind that. Mm. that Larry, think piece. Um, what, what are you thinking about his position on Bitcoin? Well, I'll wait on my own conspiracy theory there. I believe Larry Fink is positioning himself to be nominated as, as the next Treasury Secretary of the United States. And the reason why is that if you're joining the cabinet, then you do not have to pay capital gains because the U.S. government recognizes that to avoid conflicts of interest, you should be permitted to sell your interests. And we saw this previously in the past when Hank Paulson, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and others, uh, they became Treasury Secretary. They could dispose of their assets and not pay capital gains. Larry Fink created an enormous amount of wealth creating BlackRock. He's a concentrated stock position in BlackRock. And BlackRock is not growing as much as it used to in the past. So and look, he's, he's accomplished an incredible amount. He's a founder, entrepreneur. He's a builder. BlackRock, 30 to 40 years ago, was something like a Series B or a Series C company. You know, he's a real force of nature. By the way, he understands the banking system. He understands tokenization. Uh, he invests in innovation. I would be thrilled to have Larry Fink as a Treasury Secretary as well. He'd be great for crypto. Actually, I, I'm curious, like whether the approval or the rejection of the ETF, how does that factor into his, uh, you know, potential campaign to become a? I think either way it helps, and it doesn't matter because the ETF is in the headlines now. Look at how the presidential race is shaping up. The contenders for presidency that are emerging, whether it's RFK or mayor of Miami, they're pro-digital assets. Mm. So they're positioning against uh, the current administration. So Larry Fink is leaning into that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to me how it's become a partisan issue in the U.S. Like, I, I don't think that was the case a few years ago. Is that right? It's become a political issue. It's becoming increasingly partisan. I hope it doesn't become partisan. By that, mm. I mean like a left-right split. Larry Fink is a prominent contributor to the Democratic Party. Mm. Larry Summers, who is the former Treasury Secretary, was on the board of Digital Currency Group, also a Democrat. By the way, Jerome Powell, of course, Fed Chair, approved DM, which would have been a stablecoin offered by Facebook. It was rejected by the current Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. So the people in these roles matter. That was an accident of history. If that stablecoin was approved by Janet Yellen. She was the last person on. Think about that. It got past the Fed. If that was approved, we'd be living through a different history. Mm. We'd be living through a history where these digital apps from Facebook and Twitter and others uh, would enable the use of decentralized programmable money, including the gaming sector, to uh, enable payments in app. And that's why that doesn't happen. And meanwhile, if you look at uh, South Korea, Japan, or China with WeChat and the usage of red envelopes, digital programmable money is already integrated into these apps. So it's not partisan. It can become partisan. I hope it 
isn't, but it's definitely political now. Mm, it's, certainly, it's certainly becoming geopolitical as well, right? Just seeing how hard Hong Kong is pushing crypto and even China, mainland China is pushing for Web3. It's amazing to see that Japan, Singapore, China, and South Korea are running ahead of the U.S. And that is what's forcing the hand of the United States. Mm. Competition between governments uh, and the desire to be a leading capital market is, I think, ultimately will force the hand of the United States. Singapore is building an exchange on blockchain. And they, they're leaning into this. Yeah, yeah, and just speaking to you know peers in who are running crypto native funds, you know a lot of them are going not just setting up offshore entities, but actually moving out of the United States just, just so they can execute on different venues. Right, they're lo- moving to places like Dubai or London. Um, so it does seem like it's. Uh, I don't think the crypto native part is big enough to become a geopolitical issue yet, but it's definitely heading there. And from what you're saying, it seems like we're already seeing that play out at the individual level at people at the very high level. Right. And there are practical reasons to not just international competition, the practical reasons to enable tokenization is to create more liquidity and transparency for the financial system, right? So the banks, they've had a drawdown about six to 8% in their deposits and banks are traditional buyers of mortgage backed securities. Mortgage rates now six and a half percent. The 10 year just broke decisively past 4% this morning in a record jobs report. So you need institutions to buy those bonds and Crypto is this alternative capital market. Uh, look at commercial real estate. Banks need to sell off all the CRE debt, and you can't see them listed on any exchange. There's no loan level transparency. You can tokenize that. Securitization markets today are frozen. The securitization markets don't offer loan level transparency. That's partly why they're frozen, because you lose trust in the issuer and in the loans like we saw in 2008. Mm. That means buyers, investors step back. They say, I don't want to buy this. Or if I buy it, I'm only going to buy it at a sufficiently high interest rate, which hurts uh, the consumer and hurts uh, small business. I think that that's why a lot of the you know a lot of my friends who are working in traditional finance uh, you know at night they they're fascinated by DeFi right on the weekends they're checking out DeFi because it's the only place in the world where you can see each individual loan and how close they are to liquidation and you just can't get that level of transparency in in traditional finance. I'm 100 percent exactly in that camp as well, right? A bank is a ledger. It says who owes what to whom, and that's exactly what an exchange is, and that's what a clearinghouse is. Banks have broken. Risk has become increasingly centralized in big clearinghouses like ICE in the wake of the 2008 crisis. So, you know, we needed custodians and clearinghouses in the past, but now we have security through cryptography and we can settle in a decentralized way, in a way that wasn't available before. And the purpose for government as enshrined in the constitution was to secure pre-existing rights. Now that security can come through cryptography. So, you know, there's a new way to, to manage risks. We lived through the 2008 crisis. We haven't addressed the issues from that completely. And tokenization is a way to do that and advances good public policy. Yeah. And I, I suppose if the SEC does approve this ETF product, what does that imply about the whole grayscale case? Because wouldn't they be contradicting themselves, basically? If the SEC, yes, exactly right. So the SEC is in a bind here, right? They've mm-hmm. got tremendous amount of pressure from BlackRock. And if the SEC were to approve it, at the same time, you should see a near simultaneous approval for all these other ETFs. The SEC cannot be perceived to be playing favorites. Mm. There's not a special phone call that happened between BlackRock and the SEC. All that is discoverable if you're sued, just like you saw with the Hinman yeah. uh, issue that com- can come out to the public under discovery. So the SEC is subject to rule of law on pain of being litigated in court. So what I would expect is that if it's approved, you'll see multiple approvals at the same time, which of course would create competition for Grayscale, although Grayscale presumably at the same time would also be approved and then convert that to an ETF. If it's not approved, I think it's going to be incredibly frustrating. And part of this is that 
the SEC isn't issuing interpretive guidance. You know, Coinbase has sued the SEC in a request for rulemaking. Think about that for a moment. The, SEC, the Coinbase is saying, hey, SEC, we've met with you 30, 40 times. We're going to sue you in court because we're requesting you, the SEC, to write down rules. And the last time the SEC updated interpretive guidance was four years ago under Jay Clayton, before there was NFTs, before there was DeFi, and before there was widespread adoption and product market fit around stable coins. And what interpretive guidance says, it's, you can look it up online. It says, hey, market, could be exchanges generally, entrepreneurs, venture capital firms. If you conduct XYZ activity, we'll interpret it in this way, meaning if you raise money from the public without a registration and you use that to go fund a venture, we're going to call that an, an unregistered securities offering and we're going to enforce against you. That is what the content of the last interpretive guidance statement said. But there's no interpretive guidance now, including around what is required to have a successful ETF launched. Yeah, and as you mentioned, right, the uh, BlackRock obviously cannot have, you know, under the table, you know, handshake agreements with the SEC, but obviously the banks could talk to each other. So do you get the sense that this is a coordinated attempt from all these banks applying around, you know, within the same week? And are they trying to send a political message through this? It's a maneuvering. So the, the SEC has to approve the applications and the order in which they are received. Mm. And I believe first in line is 21 shares and then second is ARC. And so the reason why you saw a flurry of these applications is because they're trying to get into the queue so they can be approved quickly. That's all it is. It is a competitive response. It's not coordination. And I, I spoke with the uh, CEO of two of these ETF issuers. As soon as BlackRock filed their ETF application, all of them studied it. They looked for the deltas in any language, then they copied and pasted the relevant language into their own application and then submitted that to the SEC. Mm, I, I was speculating that these guys probably had the applications prepared beforehand for a day like this, but I also know that uh, that probably wasn't the case. It, it sounded like they, they were actually just copying and pasting. The yeah, it's not that hard. These are, these are standardized documents. I mean, what's new here is they specified that they will have a surveillance sharing approach. They didn't specify the exact method. They didn't name the vendor they didn't name which exchanges would be cooperating on the contribution of that data. Mm -hmm. and I'm really curious about this. So based on those two providers that you talked to, you know, how confident are they actually in this being approved? Or are they kind of applying because they saw BlackRock apply and they feel like they have to get that first mover advantage? One said 50-50, which really means they probably don't know. Mm. <laughs> so the second <laughs> said unlikely to be approved. Mm. So we shall see. I think as it stands now, without the lack of specification of who the vendors are and which exchanges will be contributing, then I do not think it will be approved. The answer will be is when there is a method for the SEC to detect, identify these infractions. And the recipe is to have several exchanges ideally, but maybe not required, as well as Uniswap and uh, other decentralized exchanges cooperate. That is the gold standard. And if the SEC were to reject that, uh, I, I, would, I would find that uh, hard to believe. Mm. And I guess that this is probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but let's assume that the Bitcoin ETF is approved. Do you think it's going to be, does, does it pave the way for Ethereum? Just because from, from my perspective, it seems actually a lot more difficult for ETH just because, uh, you know, the, there's a lot more volume for actual Ethereum trading on decentralized venues where there's no entities, there's no one you can really go after versus majority of, you know, Bitcoin doesn't really have any major you know decentralized exchange presence uh, currently bitcoin etf is approved and you're going to see ethereum etfs falling f following very swiftly the fact that ethereum trades on a decentralized exchange doesn't matter so long as those decentralized exchanges cooperate in a surveillance sharing agreement you can have an oracle spit out suspicious activity reports per the requirements and there's a way to make that come together. So I am excited about what the opportunity 
of an Ethereum ETF would mean. Hmm. And let's let's zoom out a little bit as well, because you mentioned that there's been you know twenty plus to thirty attempts before. So with the exception of the uh, of the fact that BlackRock's involved this time, what is different about this batch of applications versus what came before? The only addition is this recognition of a need for a surveillance sharing agreement. That's one, and then two, BlackRock cited Nasdaq, which is a credible player. You know, third, you could argue, well, hey, it's BlackRock. But the, the merit or the reputation of the issuer shouldn't affect the evaluation from the SEC. The SEC has to test against what are the regulatory requirements. Like Jason, you and I could go file for a Bitcoin ETF provided we meet the requirements, the listing standards. We file an application. We have an audit requirement. Uh, we specify how we will ensure there's liquidity, how we will have an independent valuation agent. Uh, so it should not be merit-based, uh, but the BlackRock brand does create headlines and focus. So the SEC will treat this with kid gloves. It's notable, I think, that the SEC within two weeks responded to BlackRock with a preview of the deficiency that they identified. They did not wait to come back with a 100-page rejection 260 days after the application. Mm. That's an encouraging sign, right? So the SEC may be responding to pressure in that way, where they're trying to lay out a path for BlackRock to comply. We'll see. We'll see. That's hard to, it's hard to parse out. That's one way to look at it. Mm. And this is wading into conspiracy theory venue a little bit, but there has been a theory that because of Gensler's action against Coinbase and Binance, he kind of has to, you know, give one to the millennials or like the Gen Zs and basically approve this. And this is pretty much pre-approved and they're just going through the motions. You know, how, how much credence do you give to that narrative? No, not at all. That I can say there's a 0% chance. <laughs> so, you know, when these applications are received, there is a process that's applied. There's mm. SEC staff, there are lawyers, then there are lawyers watching the lawyers, they're testing for consistency. They have mm. to apply themselves to a due process. And if not, then Freedom of Information Act, you can sue the SEC, you know, the reputations, you know, are at risk. There are many advocates for digital assets at the SEC today. Some of them have left because they're frustrated with the SEC's approach to crypto. But there are quite a few crypto advocates at the SEC. Again, even then, it doesn't so much turn on advocacy for crypto or not. It just turns on what are the legal requirements to launch an ETF, no more, no less. Mm. The SEC's job is not to weigh in on policy. Right? The reason why the SEC doesn't have a cabinet seat is because the SEC's job is to enforce the law. It's not about setting policy. And unfortunately, the SEC's approach today is tantamount to setting policy. It's becoming political, mm. uh, but they should simply be applying the laws and enforcing the laws. I think that's a great note to kind of close this out on. I think, Ram, you have helped us clear a lot of the uncertainties that we saw on Twitter, a lot of the conspiracy theories out there. Now, in terms of the general dates or general durations that people should be looking out for uh, in terms of how this ETF saga plays out, you know, what, what, what are some dates we should be looking out for? So there's a time frame where the SEC is required to respond. I believe it's uh, no more than 260 days or it could be 220 or 260 days. I have it in a thread you can take a look at it there. I don't, I don't mm. recall exactly the date offhand. Yeah, and we'll link that thread in the show notes below. I think you've written a lot on Twitter in the past few weeks as well about this topic. So we'll definitely link it to your account. And Ram, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been incredibly, incredibly helpful. My pleasure. Always a pleasure, Jason. Thank you so much. Take care now. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the Block Range Podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite apps. And in case you didn't know, this interview is also available as a video on YouTube. And if you tag the Block Range on Twitter this week and tell us what you liked about this episode, I'll be sure to respond to you as well. Now, if you'd like to go even deeper, we have a VIP tier where every week or so, we write an in-depth research brief or investment memo on a project. And we'll have exclusive AMAs with myself where I answer all your questions as well. 
Now we already have analysts from some of the top funds and companies in crypto as subscribers. So if you're serious about getting an edge in crypto, head on over to theblockcrunch.com slash VIP to learn more. And once again, thanks for supporting the show and I'll see you next week.